minutes early, hoping to see evidence of someone in the world also with me. Uh, my name is Matthew Dix. I am a storyteller, a teacher, a consultant of storytelling. I think I sound good. I don't think I have to wear these headphones anymore because they make me crazy. So how y'all doing? It's nice to see you. I am not Southern, but I like the y'all because it, uh, it covers everybody. Uh, it's a couple minutes before seven o'clock Eastern Standard Time, and I'm going to go live. I, I'm alive now, but I'm going to tell you things in a live way in just a moment. Um, I am dealing with technology and making progress, I think. Um, if you are watching this now or about to watch it, uh, fantastic. I'm thrilled that you're here, and I hope it works for you. I hope it works for someone. I didn't give a lot of notice on this particular YouTube live because I fought with the tech all day. I was online with people all day. I I can't make it quite work the way I want it to work. So I'm hoping this is going to work for us today. I'm hoping some people can pop on. I have a chat function that I think I can see now. So I've got the chat working, which is great. I've got some actual chat messages from people in my last live stream last week that I now can see. So I'm going to answer those. So if you if you are uh, if you are whoever this person was last week, uh, a Florida injury firm, um, Z C J Z helps a Florida injury attorney. Uh, you asked me some questions last week and I didn't see them because I didn't understand how to use the chat function. We're going to get that working hopefully today. So if you're watching today, great. You can ask me another question. If you happen to be watching and you want to let me know you're watching by leaving a, a message, that'd be great just so I know that it's actually working. I would love that. I guess I can put things in the chat now too. It just occurs to me. I'm really, I'm doing a lot of learning here and I hope you, um, I hope you go along with me until I figure this out. I have three topics that I'm going to be speaking about uh, today. Three topics that I'll be uh, teaching you about. Oh, good. Look, someone is here. John from Davis, California is here. John, I can see your message to me. Thank you. Oh, it's a private chat. John, I outed you as a as John from Davis, California. Sorry, John. I mean, it's it. you do have a unusual name, so. It's working. Great. All right. Great to see you. I'm still dealing with a little bit of the tech here, but I think I'm, I'm starting to figure it out, which I'm pretty excited about. So uh, so thank you. I'm going to talk about three topics today. Uh, that's typically what I'm going to do is I'll go over three different things that are going to help make you a better storyteller, whether that, that's in your personal, your professional life. I deal with both. Uh, I was on two calls today. I was um, consulting with a company that does supply chain management. So I, I have a let's say, uh, up to the knees level understanding of supply chain management nowadays. So so that's exciting. And I was dealing with a data company today. Uh, both names I'm not going to mention. I'm not sure if I'm even allowed to. So, But I was dealing with those two companies today. And actually, during my lunch today, I was helping a person help, you know, I was helping a person with their story. So I do both. So I'm happy that you're here. I'm going to be covering three topics. As I said, I'm going to talk about the power of the slow reveal to really fantastic way to tell a story. My, my kids understand it now, so I'm going to talk about that, and I'll give you some good examples. I'm going to talk about stories that are too clever, uh, the ones that fail what I call the dinner test and why you should not do these things, and then um, <laughs> this is going to be the rough one, why shortening a story is sometimes a terrible sign. I actually spoke about it today with one of my clients, so it's fresh in my mind, and I'll take some Q&A, and apparently I already have some questions here that I'm going to be able to take, so. So fantastic. I'm thrilled for you to be here. So let's talk about topic number one, which is the power of the slow reveal. In storytelling, what we want to create more than anything in the world is suspense, surprise, wonder, uh, perhaps humor at the same time too, but suspense, surprise, and wonder are the three things that are going to guarantee that people continue to listen to you. It is astounding to me that so many people, whether these are people standing on stages telling stories to auditoriums or theaters, or it is a corporate executive who is pitching their marketing deck or their new product to an audience, or someone standing at the Javits Center and delivering a keynote, it is astounding to me that wherever people are speaking, they make this bizarre assumption that because they have a microphone or because there's an audience and because people are seated and facing in their direction that people want to listen to them or that they will listen to them. And none of that is true. The sooner you make the assumption that no one wants to hear anything you have to say, you will become relentless in your attempt to get people to continue listening. And that is the, that is the position I take at all times as a storyteller. 
regardless of what I'm doing, whether I'm a storyteller in my fifth grade classroom and I'm teaching students, or last night I'm at a theater and I'm performing in front of 250 people, or I'm in a boardroom and I'm pitching a product to someone or helping someone with their talk track, whatever I am doing, wherever I am speaking, I assume no one wants to hear anything I have to say unless I give them a reason to listen. And the reasons to listen, there's not that many of them. It's suspense, it's surprise, it's wonder, it's stakes, it's humor. It is basically those five things that convince people to continue to listen, which means if your audience is in suspense because they're waiting for something, they're still listening. If you surprise them with that beautiful and delightful feeling that an audience gets that will carry them forward into the next things you're going to say. If you've planted stakes in your story, they're worried about you or they're wondering what's going to happen at the end of the story. Will you get the thing you want or not? Will you survive the battle that you're about to engage in or not? All of those things, those are stakes, right? Humor. Humor is not really any of those things. It's sort of like it's sort of like frosting. It's not real. It's not super nutritious, but it gets you through. It can turn a terrible cake into a fantastic cake. And that is what humor is. It can take a story that is absent of stakes or surprise or wonder or suspense, and it can carry forward along enough. It won't carry a whole story, but it'll get you through boring parts. It'll get you through parts that are sort of falling a little apart in your story. Humor can help you a great deal. And then there's wonder. That's the word I love the most. It sort of encapsulates all those things that I've just described, which is essentially, does the audience wonder what you're going to say next? Does the audience wonder what's going to happen in the story next? And if they are wondering, then you have them. We have to make that assumption. We have to assume nobody wants to hear anything we have to say. And so one of the ways you can keep people listening is the slow reveal, which is to say, don't say everything all at once. Here's a great example. I was helping someone prepare a talk for a wedding. And part of the talk was a journey he took that he wanted to describe to the people at the wedding. I'm not going to tell you what the journey is yet. I'm going to do the slow reveal. I'm going to show you what I taught him, which is essentially imagine as a storyteller at all times that you're a cinematographer, because that's really what you are. Your words determine what your audience sees in their mind's eye. So you are the cinematographer. You are the person in charge of pointing the camera. So the more limited the scope of the camera, the more the audience will wonder what is beyond the camera's lens. So you give them a little bit and you make them wonder, what am I not seeing yet? And you slowly expand it. So the way the story went was something like this. The man said, I'm walking across green grass. I'm walking across a field of green grass and I'm holding the hand of someone very important to me. That person is my sister. We're walking across this field and it is a field I have not been to for the last five years, which is pretty surprising. But I promised myself I would not return to this place until I had something worthy to speak about. I walk through the green grass and I pass by trees and I pass by stones, intricately carved stones. I'm approaching a particular stone. I'm approaching a gravestone. I'm approaching the gravestone of someone who has passed away who was near and dear to my heart. I'm approaching the gravestone of my mother. I am returning to the site of my mother's final resting place for the first time in five years because I have something I want to tell her. Now that is what is known as a slow reveal, which is to say, I start the audience with just grass. And then I put someone next to me and then I tell you I care about them and then I reveal their identity. And then I'm back on the grass and I give you a tree and I give you a stone and then I give you an intricately carved stone and then I give you a stone in front of me and then I reveal these are gravestones and I reveal who it is. A lesser storyteller. The rough draft version of that story is something like, I arrive at the cemetery so I can go to my mother's grave. Can you feel how everything is gone when you present a story like that? It's a disaster because there's no wonder there might be a little wonder as to like, why are you going to see the gravestone of your mother? But I don't know. That's a normal thing that people do. By slowly revealing it, you draw the audience in. By limiting the scope of that lens, sticking to grass, and then a handhold, 
and then the face of the person, and then the identity of the person, and then a tree overhead, and more grass and stones. By moving that camera around, you keep the audience wanting to see more, and wanting to see more means they're listening to you. My daughter did the same thing to me two hours ago. She came into the room and she said, so dad, yesterday I was hanging around the house and I was looking for something to read. And I said, oh, that's great. And she said, so I went to the shelf and I pulled out a book and I looked at the front of the book and then I read the back cover of the book. And then I decided, I think I'm gonna read this book. And I was honestly only half listening. And I said, fantastic. Now my daughter is an obsessive reader with a stack of books you could never imagine. She is the most obsessive reader I've ever met in my life. And I've been an elementary school teacher for 25 years. She reads more than any human being I've ever seen in my life. So the fact that she went to a bookshelf and pulled out a book is not a big deal. And yet she caught my attention because of the way she was telling the story. I said, all right, well, what was it? And she said, well, I grabbed it and I brought it upstairs and you know, I had a blue cover and weirdly enough, it had mom's name in it. And I said, Alicia? And she said, yes, dad, it was your book. I read something missing yesterday and I loved it. Do you see how she drew me in? She gets it. She's been around me too long to have not picked up on a few of my tricks. Rather than walking into the room and saying, dad, I read something missing. I want to talk to you about it. She gave me the slow reveal. And I think she could sense that as she was slowly revealing this book and giving me these clues, she was drawing me in. Instead of sort of half listening to her, I was eventually fully listening to her. Why is my wife's name in the book? Because it's dedicated to her. It's the first line in the book for Alicia. You saved me first. That's the first line in the book, the dedication. My daughter understands the slow reveal. The slow reveal is the idea that we do not need to tell the audience everything immediately. And when we do, we make a terrible mistake. We are cinematographers of our stories. We reveal a little bit at a time, slowly, to keep the audience wondering what is about to happen next. And if we're clever and we're strategic, if we focus that camera on the things that really matter, on the things that promote mystery or enhance the feeling of the moment, the tone of the moment, all of those things, then we're going to be really fantastic and holding our audience's attention. The slow reveal. My daughter gets it. Now, when she was done telling me about Something Missing, my first novel that she has read, she read it in a day, by the way, a, a 400-page adult novel that she swallowed in a day and loved, thankfully, thank goodness. When she read Memoirs of an Imaginary Friend, my third novel, she read that one first because it's actually crossed over into the YA market remarkably. I mean, the most joyous thing that has ever happened to me is my book, Memoirs of an Imaginary Friend, is in my daughter and son's curriculum. It is, a, it is a book that is used at their school this day. Uh, and it is amazing to write a book and then suddenly discover that your kids are reading it in class because it's the assigned reading. It's just, it's unbelievable. But when she read that first book, Memoirs of an Imaginary Friend, she wouldn't talk to me for two days because the book was so sad at the end. She was angry at me for the way I ended the book. The first thing she said about something missing, I loved the way it ended. And I thought, whew. Okay, I got away with that one. She's now moving on to another one. She's actually probably going to read it tonight. So we'll see what happens. But she understood how to slowly reveal things. So the slow reveal can really help you. Okay? So slowly revealing the details, the actions, the people, the descriptions of your story create wonder in the minds of your audience. It builds suspense. It can provide surprise, right? For my friend who was speaking at a wedding and his his sister was getting married and he was relating this story about how they went to visit their mother who had passed away. And the second visit was to announce the wedding. He was telling this really beautiful and fantastic story about this moment uh, that they experienced. He understood that that slow reveal would keep people listening and, and it did. It came out terrific. So the slow reveal. Okay. Be thinking about what you want to what you want to tell and what you don't want to tell. Be thinking about that camera lens and what you're pointing at and what you're not pointing at. Here's a truth about storytelling. It is what you don't say that is oftentimes more important than what you do say. What you leave out, what you avoid saying, what you delay saying, those are the things that keep people waiting as long as possible to find out what's going to happen next. So often though, 
storytellers want to say the big thing first because they want to grab your attention. They want to they want to ensure that you're going to listen to the story because you said something big and important right off the top when that's never the case. Do not say big, important things off the top. Instead, draw us into your story through the slow reveal, right? If you want to know more about that, I have courses at storyworthymd.com. And one of them is Anatomy of a Story, where I talk about these very things. Storytelling, it turns out, is really just about decision making. The decisions that I just showed you that my friend made, the decisions that Clara made when describing something missing in her reading of that book to me. The language, the sentences, the grammatical structure, the vocabulary, all of that is irrelevant compared to making good decisions. My course, Anatomy of a Story, allows you or teaches you to make good decisions when it comes to storytelling. And not only do I teach you how to make those decisions, but I craft a brand new story while teaching you how to craft your brand new story. So you get to see the process live as it happens. And at the end of the course, you get to see me tell that story for the first time. I just told it live for the first time. And when I get a recording back of it, we're going to include that in the course too. And if you purchase the course, you'll get that added bonus as soon as it is available. As soon as I have it in my hands, I will provide it to you too. So Anatomy of a Story, it's a fantastic course that will teach you all of the decisions that one must make to tell a great story. Okay, so let me move on to topic number two today. Let me move on to remembering what topic number two is. Ah, yes. All right, so topic number two, stories that are too clever, stories that fail the dinner test. This is one of those topics that originated after I attended a moth story slam a couple weeks ago in New York City. I didn't have the opportunity to tell a story. My name was stuck in the hat. My friend Jenny was with me. Her name was stuck in the hat. But what it did afford us is the opportunity to listen to 10 stories. And I actually heard one of the best stories I think I've ever heard told in my life that night. So it was an extraordinary night of storytelling. But I also tend to hear stories that I don't like or stories in which I think the storytellers make poor decisions. And this was one of the cases. The dinner test, let me to explain that to you first. The dinner test is something I talk about in my book, Story Worthy. The dinner test is the idea that regardless of where we're telling a story, last night I was telling a story to about 250 people in a theater down near Greenwich, Connecticut. Whether I'm telling a story to a boardroom full of people or a workshop full of high school principals, or you know, a couple months ago I was in Victoria, Canada in front of about 50 entrepreneurs, it doesn't matter who I'm speaking to. My goal when telling a story is to tell a version of the story that I would tell if you and I were having dinner. It's going to be a little more formal when I'm on stage or speaking to entrepreneurs or business people or, or even my students. I'm going to be a little more formal, meaning I'm not going to be interrupted and I'm not going to want to be interrupted. I'm probably going to be a little more deliberate in my telling. I'm probably going to be a little more practiced in my telling. But I want you to feel like the story I'm telling is a close cousin to the story that I would be telling you if it was just me and you and having dinner. That's the way we connect to audiences. Not when we are sort of performative and we make a big deal out of things and we, we sort of fluff everything up. That is a way to create distance between you and your audience because now you're telling them, well, I'm not being real. I'm sort of putting on a show for you. You never want to put on a show. You want people to feel close to you. You want to draw them in by making them feel like he's talking to me and this is the kind of thing he would say to me if we were sharing an Uber together or if we were walking a golf course together. Or if we were sitting in a coffee shop and you were drinking coffee, and I absolutely was not because I've never tasted this stuff, nor will I, but I'll be drinking something, probably apple juice. And if we were sitting there on couches, this version of the story that I'm on stage now and telling you, I would tell you a very similar version if we were sitting on those couches. That's the dinner test, okay? And I think it's really important. I think it's so important that our stories come across as authentic and real, the kinds of stories that we tell in everyday life a slightly upscaled version for those important moments, like on the stage and in the boardroom and in the classroom and in a, in a college auditorium in front of all those entrepreneurs, all the places that I tell stories. So the dinner test. The other night I was at a moth in New York City and someone failed the dinner test. They tried to do something interesting and I think that's always great to try something new, but it did not work. There was a storyteller and he told the story in the second person which is to say, rather than saying I did something 
or rather than saying he or she did something, which would be a little weird because then you'd be telling stories about other people, which is sometimes okay, but not in this circumstance. Instead, they were using the second person, the you as the subject. So rather than saying, I went into the store, I was looking for milk. They said, so you walk into the store, you're looking for milk. You look around the freezer case and you can't find any milk and you think to yourself, my gosh, this is the third place I've gone to and I can't find any milk. You wonder to yourself, where is the milk? That is the version of the story that was told. This odd version of the story where the storyteller was essentially talking to themselves, to themselves. It was, he was talking to himself using the you rather than using the first person, which is fully appropriate and advisable in the circumstance. It was too clever. It was just, it was just too clever. It didn't feel authentic. It didn't feel real. It felt like this storyteller had spent a long time in their home practicing this story so that it could come out in this very odd way. And I did not feel like with each word I was getting closer to the storyteller, I thought I was getting further away. If I was actually at dinner and someone tried to tell a story about their life using the second person, I wouldn't have dinner with them again. I'd think, what is wrong with this person? Right? That same night, someone used unattributed dialogue at the top of the story, which I also think is a disaster. They said something to the effect of, what are you doing over there? I shouted to the man across the street. And that's odd. That's a weird way to begin a story with that dialogue. It's a vestige of childhood. It is this weird thing that second and third grade teachers teach students to do. Start with dialogue. It gets everybody right into your story. No, it doesn't. It's weird. Can you imagine if you and I were having dinner and you said, so what happened today, Matt? How was your day? And I said, well, Layla, what do you think you're doing? I said to my student. If I opened my story like that while we were having dinner, you would not have dinner with me again or you'd make fun of me. You'd say, what's wrong with you? Are you having a, do you have a, are you having a small stroke of some kind? We don't start stories like that in the world. We don't start our stories with unattributed dialogue. We start our stories with things like, well, I was teaching today and I've got this kid named Layla and I said to her, that is the way the story is told. That is a natural, ordinary, expected, authentic way of telling the story that brings people in closer because they understand that this is how stories are told. There's nothing wrong with experimenting. There's nothing wrong with trying new things. But you have to recognize when it fails, and that was a fail. Everyone was looking around going, what is happening in this story where they're using the second person? Or that jarring effect when someone opens with unattributed dialogue. Especially, it's worse when it's onomatopoeia. Onomatopoeia is the reproduction of a sound with a word. So bam, people do this all the time too. Again, a vestige of elementary school. Bam, the door closed. That's the first line of their story. That's weird too. Tell me about your day, Matt. How are you doing? Bam, the door closed. Nope, nobody wants that. Nobody wants it on stage. Nobody wants it at dinner. No one wants it on the golf course. No one wants it in the back of an Uber. Nobody wants it anywhere. Don't do it. Sometimes we just try to be too clever in the telling of our story. And, and, and there's nothing wrong with being clever and I'm fully in support of it, but sometimes you're too clever. Sometimes you fail the dinner test because you're so clever that you've pushed people away by making your story oddly performative or so different than anything they've ever heard before that it's not going to ring true. It works in certain cases. If you've ever seen the movie Memento, it is a movie that is told backwards, right? You have to really pay attention to follow that movie. It's fantastic. There's one of those movies, right? Christopher Nolan gets one of those movies. And it, frankly, wasn't that popular. It's sort of a cult hit. You probably have never seen it. It's a very well-known movie in the film world, but it was not a blockbuster because it was a little odd and people weren't looking for something that required that much thought, that much effort in order to understand the story. It was a distance in that story created because it was told in reverse order. And there's only one of them. And there's a reason there's only one. It worked once for some people. So don't be too clever. Don't be so clever that you push your audience away by saying things that don't make any sense. Okay? Watch out for that, please. All right. 
if you want to figure out how to draw people in, how to get people closer, I have a parenting workshop that's coming up this Saturday, June 17th, 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. It's the first time I'm ever going to teach this workshop. It's a workshop designed for parents. It's designed to do a couple things for you. First, to help you find and tell the stories that your kids are going to want to hear. It's going to afford you the opportunity to open the door and walk through. To open the door sort of like metaphorically. Uh, not open the door in their bedroom, although you, you probably have that right. You're their parents. We knock first, but then we push. Uh, but it's going to allow you to get closer to your kids by telling them the stories they want to hear. Most often, stories from your childhood, the ones you have either forgotten about or failed to tell. And I'll give you some strategies on how to tell them pretty well. But the other thing that I'm going to teach you, and I think this one's even more important, I'm going to help you find ways, give you strategies to get your kids talking to you. If you have kids, and I know many of you do, I've been an elementary school teacher for 25 years. I know you got kids who come home and you say, how was your day? And they say, fine, and they disappear. And when you ask them, what happened? It happened at Charlie today, tonight at dinner. We said, how was your day, Charlie? And he said, it was fine. And we said, what'd you do? And he said, I learned. And then we said, what'd you learn? And he said, academics. Now, we got him to talk because I have strategies to get him to talk. But that's what he would have given me if I didn't have the strategies. He wasn't interested in talking tonight. He was a little upset because he didn't like the dinner. And basically, he wasn't happy with the food. So he wasn't happy with the situation. So he wasn't going to talk to us. I eventually got him to talk with the strategies that I'm going to teach on Saturday. June 17th. If you want to join that workshop, if you want to participate in it, you can go to storywearthemd.com and uh, enroll. It's going to be great. We're going to have a four-hour workshop. It's going to be virtual. You'll get a recording of the workshop when it's done. You're going to get a workbook that we can use during the workshop and you can use after the workshop. It's going to be out an hour. If you want to bring your kids in and participate, that'll be fun too. I'm going to group you up at, at times. You'll be able to listen to other people. It's going to be great. It's going to be great. Uh, Saturday, June 17th. Let me make sure I have that date right because gosh, you know what? I've gotten the dates on things wrong before. So it is Saturday and it's June 17th. It's the day before Father's Day. If you have a father in your life, what a great treat. What a great gift. Give them the gift of this course. Okay? All right. Let me go to number three. <laughs> Shortening a story is sometimes a bad sign. This is a very um, business-oriented topic. I guess it applies in all things, but very businessy. I cannot tell you the number of times I am told by a vice president or a director of communications or marketing, someone who's going to have to take a stage and deliver a keynote or someone who's pitching a product, a salesperson, all of these people. I cannot tell you how many times I am told that the pitch deck or the speech or the keynote or the demo, all the things that we create in business to help business people communicate to customers and clients and partners and people like that, how often these people tell me it's too long. They say, God, it's eight minutes. Can we shorten it to five? Sometimes that's appropriate. The most well-told stories are often the shortest versions of those stories. The shortest version of every story is oftentimes the best version of every story. But so often in business, this is not the case when someone says it's eight minutes, but can we bring it down to five? Almost always, the reason you want a shorter talk in the business world is because you're not entertaining, because you're not a good public speaker, because you lack confidence in your public speaking abilities, because you know deep down in that heart of yours that people don't listen to you. And so you assume that if you're not entertaining or you're underconfident or people just don't like it when you speak, Rather than going for eight minutes and suffer for eight, let's shorten it and suffer for five, which is a foolish idea, right? It is ridiculous. It is essentially just, it's essentially just taking this unfortunate problem you have and rather than fixing it, just shortening it, right? So we're not going to take off your whole leg. We're just going to take it off at the knee. You're still going to have a problem walking, right? It doesn't really help that much. The fact of the matter is, if you want your content shorter, you need to ask yourself, do I want it shorter because it feels long, I'm saying more things than I need to say, we're going on about things too much, we're providing too many examples, those things happen, that could be possible, or ask yourself, do I want my speech, my keynote, my demo, my pitch, do I want it shorter because I don't want to speak so long? Because I don't feel good speaking, because I'm underconfident about my speaking, because I'm not 
entertaining because I've never made a person laugh or lean forward or gasp in my life. Oftentimes, it's the latter. Oftentimes, I'm dealing with people who have never made an audience lean forward in suspense or gasp with surprise or laugh with amusement. It's not your fault. I mean, it's your fault in that rather than trying to solve the problem by, by improving your skill level, by learning how to tell stories and speak publicly and do all the things we need to do, rather than doing that, your solution is just, I'll do it less and it won't hurt as much. If I, if I only bore the audience for five minutes instead of eight minutes, that'll be better for all of us, right? It's not better for your company. It's not better for your, it's not better for the profits. It's not better for the margins. It's not better for all the things you're trying to do when you get on the stage in the first place. If you're getting on the stage to deliver a keynote about your brand new product rollout, and you're shortening that keynote because you think it's boring, the problem is not the length. The problem is it's boring. And sometimes it's boring because it's crafted poorly, but a lot of times it's boring because you are boring, because you are not working on leveling up. You have to ask yourself, did my story fail? Did my talk fail because the content was bad or because I am just not delivering it in the way it needs to be delivered? There are many times in my consulting career when I have watched someone deliver a pitch to a group of salespeople or, or a salesperson delivering a pitch to customers or a vice president of marketing on a stage in a large space speaking to you know, an auditorium full of people. I've watched these people and I've watched them fail. And then later on, when I'm reviewing the reasons they fail, I will take part of their talk and I will deliver it for them. And it's not the nicest thing to do, to show them how the content was fine, it was you, but it's an important thing to recognize. I recognize it at times. I can count, thankfully, on one hand, the number of times that I ended up on a stage and I did not do my best job. Just recently, I was at a, at a story slam, a moth story slam in Boston. And I did not have my A game. I did not have the best content I had ever had in my life. My story was like a B plus. And quite frankly, my stories are A plus stories. This one was a B plus. I managed to win the story slam with the B plus story. And my production manager, Kaya, later on in the car, she said, that was not your best story. And I said, I know, I felt it too. She said, but you did all that stuff you do at the end of the story that convinced everyone that your B plus was an A plus. And that was true too. I understood how to like really lean into the laugh and then pull back for suspense. I understood how to like get quiet and slow when I was making my point at the end. I understand how to pull tears from eyes when, with the way I speak rather than what I'm saying when what I'm saying is not so good. That's what you have to learn to do and you can learn how to do it. I am not a magician. I was not born with the ability to do these things on stages. It was learned. It was practiced. It is practiced constantly. It is constantly learning new things. I'm on a stage and I go, wow, that worked in a way I didn't expect it to work before. Amazing. You can do the same. But you have to be honest with yourself. Is the content bad? And if it is, fix it. It's your content. You might say, well, my marketing team. No. The person who is speaking the words, that person is ultimately responsible for the words. You may have a team of people, I might be on that team, who's putting the content together for you, but if it's no good, you are the ultimate arbiter of that content. You're the arbiter of the words that come out of your mouth. And if they're not gonna be good, you have to say, stop, they're not good, let's fix them. But we also have to be honest that sometimes it's just, we don't do a good job performing. And that's an important word, performing. We can do one of two things when we're standing in front of people. We can present or we can perform. And here's the truth. No one has ever in the history of the world been looking forward to a presentation. No one has ever said, God, I can't wait to hear this presentation. But a performance? People pay a lot of money for a performance. I bought Broadway tickets for my family today to celebrate my wife's conclusion of this program she's been working on for a year to become an English speaker of other language teacher. Right, So I got Broadway tickets. They were expensive because they're a performance. I would never pay that much money for a presentation. You are going to present. You're probably going to bore people. You're going to perform. You're going to raise the level of everything. So you got to be honest with yourself. Is it you? Is it the content? It's one of those two things if you're failing. And if you're asking for the story, 
the talk, the pitch, the deck to be shorter, I would suggest, I would offer the idea that quite often it's not the content. It's that you want it shorter because you want to get off that stage quicker because something's not working on that stage for you and it's you. So consider that. I know it's harsh. I say this live to people all the time. This is not a thing I'm saying here for the first time. If, you, if you've dealt with my, if you're a client of mine or you talk to my clients, you'll know I say these things to them in real time because we have to be honest. You know, my friend David, the other night we were having dinner, he said, you're one of the easiest people to give notes to because I know I can say anything about the work you're doing and you receive it without any sort of thin skinned response. And he's correct. It doesn't mean I always listen to what he says. I don't always take his advice. I, I quite often do. He's pretty bright. He, he's a writer and a screenwriter. He's great. I don't always take his advice, but I always receive it well because that's what we have to do. We have to receive our feedback well so that we can improve. So I hope you receive it well. All right, that's my third topic. Oh, let, before we go to questions, I have an announcement. Uh, we're going to make a formal announcement. I don't even know if my team wants me to make this announcement now, but I'll make it anyway. Hey, I have a new course. We haven't really announced it yet. It's sitting on the website. A couple of people actually found it and bought it already, but we haven't told people it's there. You'd have to be like going in the course section and see it. I have a brand new course. It's Humor Volume 1. It is a course designed to teach you the strategies that I use, that comedians use to make things funny. We often think of people as being funny. We often say, oh, they have a great sense of humor or they can make people laugh. And it's true. It's true. But it's not like magic. It's not like the words I say are different than the words someone else says. I say carrot and it makes people laugh. You say carrot, it doesn't. That's not how it works. We're using strategies. And those of us who understand humor, either we've studied it or it's sort of innately sunk into our bones over the course of our lives, we use strategies. I have about 25 very specific humor strategies that I teach people to help them become funnier in life, to help them raise the level of amusement and humor in the content, in the stories, in the pitches, all the work that they're doing. If you want to be funny, you can learn these strategies and you can deploy them. You can definitely deploy them in prepared speeches and talks and stories, and then eventually they become natural to you. Humor Volume 1 offers you the first five of those strategies, plus a lot of other things. They're actually animated. So you get to watch me talk about these strategies as they play out in an animated fashion in the course. I love it. And it also comes with a workbook with lots of practice so that you can begin doing this on your own. And so Humor Volume 1 is now available at storyworthymd.com. Volume 2, 3, 4, and 5 will eventually be coming as well. But Volume 1 is now available. We haven't announced it yet. A couple of people have found it. Now you can go find it if you want. And you can purchase it for yourself. And let me know what you think. Uh, we're working on Volume 2 now, so I can't wait to get it out to you. Uh, the strategies, they're not hard to use. They're rather simple. The tragedy of the strategies is after you learn them, you can't watch like a, a comic or you can't watch a, you know, a special by one of these very famous comedians without seeing all the strategies playing out as they're using them. You suddenly realize, oh, they're not just naturally funny. They are they're sort of like doing the math. They're figuring out, oh, well, this is a way to be funny if I construct it this way or I do this. Suddenly, like all of the humor is laid out to bear for you. You'll see it so clearly. So, so I hope you try it out. Um, let me know what you think. If you purchase it, um, go through the course. Tell me uh, how it worked out for you. Okay? All right. I'm going to take a few questions and we'll, we'll say goodnight. I'm going to pop over here and see if questions actually work, if this is working. I hope this is working. I see, um, I see a couple people here. Oh, good. Can't find the group chat, but no worries. John A, nice to see you. Um, I'm not sure if the slow reveal would work at dinner compared to a moth stage. Well, I got to tell you, John, I think it works at dinner too. John is asking me, does um, it, there's a fine line between being gimmicky and that slow reveal. I'm not sure if the slow reveal would work as well at dinner compared to a moth stage. I would say it works but you can't like stretch it out as long as I stretch it out in my examples. The Clara example actually happened right before dinner. Like that Clara slow reveal did not feel gimmicky to me at all. It actually brought me from half listening to my daughter to fully listening to my daughter in the span of, I don't know, 17 seconds. It worked really well. I use the slow reveal at dinner. I do not use it into the length and breath that I described with walking through that cemetery, but I might use three of those steps. I might say something to the effect of, 
So I'm walking across this open field and uh, it's actually a cemetery. There's stones to the left and right. And I'm, I'm walking, I've got someone with me uh, she's holding my hand, it's my sister. And we're approaching a stone that's super important to us. It's my mom's stone. I might say it like that. Slow reveal. I said it a little quicker because I know I'm at dinner and I got to move things along. I got food to put in my mouth, but still the slow reveal. I agree. You can do much more of a slow reveal and you can do it slower if you're on a stage and you're performing, but I think it applies uh, at dinner too. And I definitely think it applies in business when you're revealing things like your new product. I'm going to do a couple videos soon on some product launches and show you how brilliant CEOs and brilliant vice presidents of marketing have done the slow reveal in their uh, launch of a new product and how it works brilliantly. But I agree, you, you have to modify, obviously, if you're going to be, um, if you're going to be dealing with like dinner guests. So that is true. Okay, let me see if I have any other questions here. Um, you know, there was a question that someone asked. It says, please talk about how you'd apply transformational moments if you were a personal injury lawyer making YouTube videos about claim strategies, mistakes to avoid, and settlement stories. Well, I work with attorneys quite a bit. Uh, I worked with a DUI attorney for a long time, someone who's helping people with those problems. And I work with a personal injury attorney uh, in Florida quite extensively. I would be able to tell you what I do for those people when they are standing in front of juries and judges but you've asked me an interesting question, how to make videos using storytelling. I guess the only suggestion I have, it's not gonna be very good is, well, I worked with an attorney. I worked with an attorney a couple years ago and this attorney decided to essentially tell a moth story as part of their opening argument. In fact, they opened with a moth story. It was a four minute version of what I would tell on stage rather than the traditional opening that, a, that an attorney would, would use. And it went beautifully, won the case, one of the largest settlements he has ever won. Called me right after the trial, like instantly after the trial, Matt, we won. I don't think it was a lot because of me. I know that an opening statement is not the most important part of a trial, but it was the most daring part for him because he had never done it that way before. And I, I explained to him, one of the great things about being an attorney is the jury you have has never been a jury before, so they don't know what to expect. So if you do something different, the only people who are gonna think you're acting a little weird is the judge, and who cares, and your opponent, your, your opposing counsel, and who cares, right? The jury are the only people that really matter, so they don't know you're doing something different, like performing a moth story-ish kind of opening statement, or at least to begin it. Uh, so they'll go with you, and they did, and it worked out great. I, I guess if my attorney client, the guy who works with me, wanted to make a video like this, I would say, well, tell that story. Tell that moment, that transformational moment as you're telling this moth story. When you notice for the first time in a long time, the jury is leaning in and can't wait to hear the next thing you say. And that you make jury members cry during an opening statement. Like, So I guess if you're doing this kind of work, and you want to make YouTube videos about it, what you want to do is just sort of reproduce those moments that you've had so that people can see, so other attorneys can see what it is like to have those moments. But I'll ponder your question some more. That is a very, very tricky question because that is a question not only about how to do something, but how to make a video about that something. So that's tricky. But thank you. Uh, person also says, bought Story Worthy a week ago on the second listen already. Thank you. You know, what I often have to do is I buy an audio book of something and then I love it so much and realize I need to notate it and highlight it, then I have to go buy the, the hard copy as well. So I own a lot of audiobooks that I also own the hard copy of. You can actually see many of them here and over here in the studio. Uh, so other than Story Worthy, what's the best book that will help me tell better stories and use stories as metaphors? Well, that's a tricky question for me. I had to read basically all the storytelling books there were when I uh, sold Story Worthy to my publisher. You have to read these comparables and talk about why your book is going to be better than everybody else's. Turns out, I kind of couldn't find a good storytelling book. I couldn't find one that I would recommend. Now I'm gonna recommend one in a minute, but it's not like story worthy. I think the reason that story worthy and the reason I'm able to do what I'm doing now, why I'm effective is because I've been an elementary school teacher for 25 years. I understand how to take large complex processes like storytelling and break them down into small repeatable parts. The same way I teach children long division. Long division is a large multi-step difficult to understand, complicated process that fifth graders need to learn 
and I understand how to break it down and teach them how to practice and repeat and all of those things. I do the same thing with storytelling, except storytelling is better than long division because if you make one mistake in long division, the answer is wrong. In storytelling, you take one of my strategies, leave the other 150 behind, you're still a better storyteller. You don't have to get them all. You just get the ones you want. So I don't really have a storytelling book recommendation that does what my book does, which is tactically teach storytelling. But I guess... I don't know if it's here. Oh, it is. Good. Here, I'm going to recommend this book to you. I'm going to recommend this book to you as another book that you can look at. The Sea We Swim In, which is a terrible title. It says, How Stories Work in a Data-Driven World by Frank Rose. It's great. It's not tactical. It doesn't teach you how to tell a story. But it does deal in metaphor quite a bit. And it's, uh, it's very good. I love this book. I own the audio version of it. And then I went and bought this version and I've been notating it ever since. And I reference it in the new storytelling book that I'm working on right now, Stories Sell. Stories Sell. Yeah, Stories Sell. That's my new storytelling book that I need to get finished so I can get it in your hands. So I would recommend this book. I also just finished a book called The Science of Storytelling. I cannot remember the author, but I just finished it. And I would say the first two chapters of that book deal with metaphor in a really fantastic way that I've also cited in my new book. And then it sort of like falls apart for me. It not, it's not a bad book. It just doesn't deal with things that I want to deal with. It sort of goes into fiction and I'm a novelist. I'm a fiction writer, but I don't, I don't want strategies for that. I'm looking for strategies for it to help you become better storytellers. So the sea we swim in Frank Rose, that's my recommendation. You, you know, I'm reading it or I read it because it's on the top of my pile. All right. Uh, I'll take a couple more, see if, if there are a couple more. Um, oh, that's a nice. Yours, I appreciate, thank you. I appreciate you saying that my book is the best book on storytelling out there. How would you recommend, I'll take this one as the last one, how would you recommend that I find other YouTubers who've read your book and apply the principles to the videos so that we can discuss each other's transformational moments and story ideas? That's a great question. Well, if you haven't been to my YouTube, my YouTube, not my YouTube, if you haven't been to my Facebook channel, that's probably the best place to go. There's lots of people there. Uh, we've I don't know, got 2,000 people in the group now. And um, they're there to listen um, and talk about storytelling. I leave a lot of resources there. The name of the Facebook group, if you're on Facebook and using it, is Storyworthy, Storytelling for Business and Professionals. And if you just ask to join, we'll let you in. And um, then you can begin that conversation. You'll also find lots of resources that I provide regularly there to help you become a better storyteller. You know, I think one of the best options you really have in the world, the best way that I have connected with storytellers is going to storytelling shows. Now, I don't know where you're located, but uh, we didn't have a storytelling show here in Hartford. So my wife and I launched a storytelling show. And now I have an enormous community of storytellers, both business people and people who just want to be entertaining and comedians. And I've got some documentarians and people like that. All of them have sort of gathered in our community and it's been wonderful. But I also go to New York and Boston and I meet lots of people there. I learn from them. They learn from me. We, um, we exchange lots of ideas. You know, when you go to a storytelling show and you become part of that community, whether you ever take the stage or you're just a permanent audience member who gets to know the storytellers and engages in conversation with them, that's a great way to communicate too. So I don't have a YouTube answer for you, but I do have my Facebook answer, Storyworthy Storytelling for Business and Professionals. All of you should join it. I, I put resources there all the time. I, I post my links to these YouTube lives, which I think I've almost figured out most of the tech on, which I'm pretty excited about. So I'll actually be announcing them ahead of time. As a result, I see that the person who asked me the question is in Miami. I do know that there's storytelling in Miami. I do believe there's actually Moth Story Slams in Miami. So, so I think you can get there. Uh, I got one more question, so I'm just going to grab one more. John says, did you create a curated show or a slam show? When I created the show, we created a curated show. We actually have now something called the Great Hartford Story Slam that happens twice a year. We partner with two more shows that now exist in Hartford. There's three storytelling shows that I'm aware of right now in the Hartford area. There may be more. Uh, but we created a curated show. My wife hosts it. I always tell a story in every show. And then we have four to five other storytellers, always at least one brand new storyteller who has never told a story before. But when we launched it, we just started with eight of our friends who we thought could tell a good story. We made some mistakes in the beginning. We didn't give people a time limit. So we had a night where someone went 27 minutes and we didn't have a way to get them off the stage because we hadn't devised a way to get them off the stage and hadn't given them a time limit. So we realized, well, we've really stuck ourselves here. Now we understand much better how to produce a show. We produce more than a hundred shows now and we sell out most of our shows. 
So uh, now there's a time limit to a certain degree. Every story sort of has an appropriate amount of time. We hear the stories ahead of time. We offer feedback and commentary. We ask storytellers to work with us so that um, what they bring to the stage is going to be the best version of their story that they could possibly tell. We have a stable of outstanding storytellers now in the Hartford area. Some of them have gone off to tell stories at the Moth and other big shows all over the country. And some of them are just local people who we love putting up on the stage because people love them. But yeah, we started as John with a curated show, uh, friends. And then uh, the trick is those friends bring friends. And oftentimes your friend turns out not to be the best storyteller in their, in their group. They often have an even better storyteller in their group. And so we bring that person on stage and, and it's been great. Our struggle is always diversity. We're always trying to increase our diversity. We have a lot of diversity in terms of age and religion, but quite honestly, we don't have a lot of racial diversity and we're always fighting for it. Uh, I just think sadly that we live in divided communities and we're always trying to connect our community as much as we can. So we certainly have lots of people of color telling stories on stages for us, but we're, we're always like fighting to find them. And, um, and we want more, we want more. And part of it is getting those people to come to the show, which means reaching out to those communities and letting them know that the show exists and um, they are welcome to come and that they're encouraged to come. And it might be something that they're going to love. So doing all those things can be really helpful to bringing those people into your show. Quite often, our audience members become our storytellers. And sometimes we'll bring in some ringers. I have pros in New York and Boston who will come to Hartford and perform for us, and that's great too. And we produce some shows. If you're thinking about doing this, um, we produce shows in museums and art spaces, in theaters, libraries we've done before. Uh, we have some sort of, we have about four venues that we sort of partner with frequently now and love. We have some requirements. We like there to be alcohol served because we want it to be a night out for people. And some people like to have a glass of wine. So that's nice. So we tend to partner with locations that can serve some, some beverages for our guests. Not always though. We have places that that doesn't work out and we, we do those places too. Um, we like to be in control of the sound. I'm a sound guy. I've been a wedding DJ for 25 years and I, I tend not to trust anybody else. So I tend to be in charge of my sound, but lots of these places have sound and you can let them do it for you. And that's great too. Uh, but it's not hard. Gather some friends. Our first show had about 200 people at it and we expected less than 40. So you'd be surprised that if you put out the word and you get a bunch of people to tell stories, how quickly you'll gather an audience. And if you do a good job, in other words, if your storytellers do a good job, you will soon find yourself with a storytelling show and you'll need a name all of a sudden. And our name is Speak Up. So if you come to Hartford, Speak Up Storytelling, we just produced a show last month, fantastic show. Uh, actually two shows last month. We, did a pre we produced one of our typical shows, which is just a bunch of storytellers. And we also did a show with Voices of Hope, an organization that is committed to preserving and um, telling the stories of the Holocaust. And so we worked with six children and grandchildren of Holocaust survivors to tell both their stories and while embedding part of the story of their survivor within their own story. It's essentially stories about how being the child or grandchild of a survivor impacts your life too. And we get some history along the way. It's great. So we did both of those shows um, last month. And we'll have some more coming up soon. So if you're in the Hartford area or you want to fly here, that'd be great. I'm actually doing a solo show on July 30 and 31st at Theater Works in Hartford, a very beautiful theater. I'm producing a, my own show directed by Kaya Pazdersky. It's going to be a 90-minute solo show. Uh, I'm doing two nights. We're recording it, and we're going to turn it into a special that I probably will not be able to put on any important platforms, but I will try. So I have someone who, a Broadway director who's asked to see some of my work. So I've decided when a Broadway director asks to see your work, you do the best possible work you can. So that's what I'll be doing on July 30 and 31st. If you want to come, there's only a few tickets left. Both shows are almost sold out, but if you'd like to come, I'd love to have you. So I think we're done. Oh, look, someone mentioned my show. Thank you. July 30 and 31st, my show in Hartford. That is true. It's called You're a Monster, Matthew Dix. If you go to Theater Works in Hartford, uh, you can find it. You can also... Um, Find it at matthewdix.com. You can find it at speakupstorytelling.com. I don't know if you can find it at storywordymd.com, but you should be able to find it. I think it's on a calendar there. Uh, but just theaterworks.com uh, slash um, Matthew. Uh, just search You're a Monster Matthew Dix. You'll find it. There's a very few There's very few tickets left, but grab one. Um, come and see me. I'd love for you to come out and um, fill the theater so that when we record it, it looks like people like me. 
All right, that's it for tonight or for today, whenever you're watching it. I thank you for watching it. Uh, if you've watched it and you like found it suddenly, now that I think once I click leave studio, I'm going to make sure everything worked. And if everything, if everything seemed to work, uh, watch, you're coming to my show from California. That's a lot of pressure. Thank you, whoever you are. The text is Lou Banka Zoatava. You're coming from California to see my show. That is a lot of pressure, but that's fine. I eat pressure for breakfast, so I'm thrilled. I can't wait to see you. Make sure that after the show, I'm going to hang around. Come and see me. Say, hey, I'm the person from California. I'd love to meet you. All right. If the tech worked out here and my crew ha is happy with me and everything seems to have worked out, you'll get uh, much earlier notice on these in the future. Honestly, for the next few weeks, it's going to be Monday, 7 o'clock p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So if um, you want to schedule that um, in your book every Monday, 7 o'clock p.m. Eastern Standard Time, I'll be here. I tend to teach three new things every week and then take some quick q and I'm lining up some guests. I actually might have a guest next Monday if I can make that tech work. That'll be pretty fantastic too. So uh, making any public appearances on the West Coast, John asks. I don't think so, John. I don't think so, but we will see. Um, I am not quite certain. If there is a moth story slam when I'm on the West Coast this summer, I will attend that and maybe get the stage, but I'll let everyone know. So stay in touch, okay? Stay um, stay tuned. Uh, we will see. So thank you, everyone. It's uh, It was a pleasure speaking to you. I hope you enjoyed it. Let me know uh, what you thought. You can send me an email, matthew at storyworthymd.com. Uh, MatthewDix at gmail.com works just as well. I'd be happy to hear um, what you want to hear next. And um, we might have a special guest next time if I can make that tech work. So we shall see. Okay, thanks. Have a, have a wonderful, have a wonderful day. And I hope you find some stories to tell. Take care.